Back in May, if anyone were here, back in May, I talked about the faith of the centurion. And the faith of the, of the centurion had great faith. Well, we're going we're gonna to explore a little bit of the measure of faith, the levels of faith that are available to us. And it's all going to be determined what we want. God doesn't push anything on us, doesn't push, push his faith on us, doesn't, doesn't make us grow in faith, doesn't make us uh, uh, do things that we want to do. Everything, when God is concerned, is voluntary. Everything de depends on you, me. Doesn't depend on uh, your grandma and grandpa, doesn't be, depend on your parents, doesn't depend on on the pastor, doesn't depend on how good the church is, doesn't depend on how good the worship singers are, doesn't depend on, on how good the pastor is, doesn't depend on how good the elders of the church are, or the board of the church, doesn't depend on my next door neighbor. My faith only depends on me and God, me and the word of God. So everything that we want in life, as far as God's concerned, if we include him, then it's me, it's me and him. How much do I want of God? How much do I want of faith? So the centurion had great faith. Well, we're going to go through a few, few little steps. And I got a lot of scriptures here, and we're going to try to get through um, most of them, if not all of them. It, I'm trying to cram trying to cram in a lot of material within just a half hour. So bear with me. Father, we're going to focus on your word. We're going to focus on the love that you have for us. We're going to focus on everything that you applied in this word of God. Everything that you put in this word, we're going to try to focus on it. We're going to try to receive it by faith, and we're going to try to apply the word of God to our lives, Lord, to, so that we can have an ever-increasing faith, just as your word says. We thank you, Father, for it. We thank you, Father, for focusing on our word. We thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit will speak out things that I need to share and stuff that I don't need to share, I will not share. I just want to be focused on you. I just want to focus on the word that you have for me today. In Jesus' name, that I can share it effectively and effectively and powerfully in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. We trust you in your goodness for us. Okay, so 12, Romans 12, 1 through 5. Some of these scriptures I went through before. Some of these scriptures uh, might be new to you. Uh, I, I'll, I always use the New King James Version. I like, I like that version. It's, it's close to the King James Version. And... As I might have shared before, the closer you can stay to the original version, the better you are if you can, because through different versions, the words change. And sometimes the words become weaker through different versions. But I'll just throw that out to you, and, and you determine what version of the Bible you like, and then you can stay with it. I like the New King James Version. Okay. Uh, Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Okay, as we present our bodies, uh, we need to present our bodies wholly and acceptable. That will help our faith. That will help increase our faith. That will help understanding the Word of God. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have to transform our mind. When we come to Jesus, our spirit becomes new, our spirit becomes renewed, but our mind stays the same. Our body stays the same. So we have to continue to renew our minds. For I say, verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Stay humble, he's saying. When we stay humble, we can learn more from you, 
can learn from, more from me. I can, I can learn more from, from pastors. I can mer- learn more from evangelists and missionaries when I can stay humble. Then we ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Okay, my title of the message is Faith is Measured. And this is the very first part. When you become Jesus, when you come to the Lord and make him Lord and Savior of your life, each one is given a measure of faith. Okay, just, just like uh, Jesus uh, gave an example of the talents. Some, talent, uh, some people have been given three, ta- three talents, some two talents, some one talent. What did they do with those talents? Some, one, one guy buried it. Another guy invested it. Another guy uh, spent it. So what are you going to do with your measure of faith that you got when you, when you got born again? So when I get born, when we get born again, make Jesus Lord or Savior, we get a measure of faith. What are we going to do with that measure of faith? Okay, in Hebrews 11, let's go to Hebrews 11, verse 1 through 3. Hebrews 11, back behind Timothy. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Okay, now faith is. So faith is now. Faith isn't you wait till you see something and then I'll believe. Faith isn't you wait till I feel something and then I believe. Faith is now. When you speak faith words, you're speaking something that you can't see right now, something that you can't feel right now. Faith is now. A lot of people struggle with that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The substance. Okay. So I went to the dictionary and substance. Substance is a confidence, conviction, and then I put experience. So if, if you're making a cake, you, ha- you have to have the substance to make a cake. You have to have the, the sugar. You have to have the cream. You have to have the cake mix. Uh, you have to have uh, yeast, maybe. Um, so you have to have the ingredients. Same thing with faith. You have to have the substance. And substance is a confidence, a conviction, and then I put experience. Confidence and conviction is I'm going to take God's word for what it says. And that's, that's, going, to, that's going to strengthen my conviction of the word of God, that it's true. We have to, to have strong faith, to have to grow your level of faith, you have to know that the Bible is true and I'm going to stand on the Word of God. Without that, your faith won't have the substance. And we have to have substance in our faith to get what we want, to get what we need in our daily lives, to get a healing. If we need healing in our our lives, we have to have that confidence and that conviction in the word of God that those scriptures say that is true to see it come to pass. And I and I put experience in. I think as we go in in our walk with the Lord, as we exercise our faith, we will see some things that we got got the victory in. And so that experience of that will help you layer that on top, of, uh, on, uh, on top of another layer that will strengthen your belief in God, strengthen your belief in the Word of God through experiences. And I'll get to some experiences are, are misguided, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So the dictionary definition of substance is the real or essential part of something. Okay? So the dictionary definition, the real or essential part of something. It is the something. It is the faith. That's why I kind of like, uh, we, 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 we had to change our name from Agar's Chapel. 
uh, because they wanted that name with that building to stay with that building, which is fine. But we changed it to Faith Chapel. Faith, that is the, that is the evidence, the conviction, the strength, the confidence that this church is going to be based on is faith. We went to uh, Pastor Brian and me and uh, a couple uh, other people of this church went to Rama Bible Training College, and they exercised faith. They wanted to teach faith. Faith is essential to the Word of God. You cannot believe on Jesus without faith. You cannot believe on God without faith. You cannot believe for things in the future without faith. So faith is essential to what we stand for, to what God wants to do in our lives. Faith is all-encompassing everything. So the Bible dictionary of substance is confidence, assurance. I have confidence, I have substance, I have assurance. I have assurance of the Word of God. Assurance of my faith in the Word of God. So if I'm not totally having conviction or assurance of the Word of God, then my faith will be at a weaker level. And it won't be like the centurion uh, who had great faith. Jesus said, you have great faith. Not even in Israel do I find somebody who has great faith. And as I said back in May, Israel was the chosen nation. Israel was the ones that's supposed to have faith. Israel was the ones that's supposed to believe on Jesus and, and that Je Jesus died on the cross, rose the third day, and is now seated at the, at the, at the, at the throne of God. So Israel was the chosen nation. But Jesus says to this centurion, who was a Roman soldier, who most of them did not believe, he told this centurion, you have great faith, not even in all of Israel. So that was, that was kind of a, a slam dunk against Israel. And you would have thought that they would come over and, and to believe on Jesus. But some have, a lot of them have not, and we won't get into that. But we'll move on. Okay, so Hebrews 4, 11, 6, 4, 11. Hebrews 4, 11. And this is one of my favorite scriptures. And this is, this is, this is what we need to have a conviction of, the assurance of, the word of God. Okay, Hebrews 4, 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. And I'll get back to the, the another scripture after this group that we can't have rest when we're, when we're, when we're diligent and follow the leading of God and, and trust his word. We can have rest in our faith. We can have rest when we speak out faith words because of our conviction, of our assurance of the word of God. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Verse 12. For the word of God is, a, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So if I'm going to have strong faith, to grow my faith, then I'm going to have to believe that the word of God, this Bible, the word of God, I'm going to have to believe that it is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This Bible is living, it's active right now. It's right here in, in these paper, pages, this is a living, living creation, a living word of Bible. It is living, it is alive. But if I don't believe that it has any power in it, then that's gonna weaken my faith. That's not gonna strengthen my faith. I have to believe that this word is true. I came to Jesus back in 1990 because of truth. 
I was listening to the pastor preaching and the word of God just resonated on the inside of me that this is truth. I wanted to believe truth and I acted on truth by accepting it and, and making it my own. I made this Bible my own, my own cherished property that I cherish the word of God. And that's how you can kind of can strengthen your, your faith. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Okay? A lot of people combine soul and spirit together. They're different. A lot of people combine the soul and spirit to being the same thing, but they're different. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. It's your mind, will, and emotions, your soul. But your spirit man is on the inside. Your spirit man lives on the inside. It, it abides in, in, on the inside, somewhere down here. It, it abides down here. Your spirit is the true, the heart of a being. Uh, a lot of people have mentioned like the heart of a tree. You got the rings in the tree going up in the, in the stalk of the tree and the base, the base of the trunk, those rings, that's the, that's the heart of the tree. That's the lifeblood of the tree. That's the heart of the tree. Your spirit is the lifeblood of your body, the lifeblood of your mind. Your spirit is, is everything that will put you over in life. You strengthen your spirit, you'll be an overcomer. You'll live in victory. Okay, so the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Two-edged sword is sharp. sharp. Some, some people say the, the top side of the, of the, of the sword is, uh, is for you to, to shave away some of the things that don't need to be in your life. The bottom, the bottom side of the sword is for the devil. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It is a weapon. The word of God is a, it is a weapon. So you have to think of it as a weapon. You have to think of it as a life source. You have to think of the scriptures as, as a weapon also against, against the devil. Because he's always going to try to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10. 10. He's always going to try to kill, steal, and destroy. And you're going to have to use the weapon to live in a victorious life. Otherwise, you're just going to live on que sera, sera. What will be, will be. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. That's no life for a Christian. That's no life for, for a spirit-filled believer in Christ that wants to live by faith. That's no life. We can be guided by the Spirit. We can be led by the Spirit of God, and we can live victorious in every aspect of our lives, but it's going to be up to us. It's not going to be up to God. It's not going to be up to Jesus. They already did everything that they needed to do. It's going to be up to me. It's going to be up to you. So you can have as much as God as you want. Okay, uh, verse 11 and joints of marrow. So the word of God can discern the joints and marrow, the joints in your fingers and marrow in your finger. They're all, they're all, they're so mended and meshed together. But the word of God is sharper than that. It can, it can, it can cut between the marrow and, and the joint. And sometimes it's not pleasant when we uh, take the word of God for what it is. It kind of it kind of shows us, man, why, 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 been I, why have I been doing that for so many years? And that's wrong. And, and so, it, so it'll kind of cut something like that. And, and it'll be up to us whether, yeah, I don't need that in my life anymore. I can, I can move from there to here. I don't need that in my life anymore. So it's going to be up to us whether we want to recognize that and move from this position to this position. Okay, and then, then the Word of God says here in verse 12, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the Word of God is going, is going to discern between 
the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So, like when we follow, when we follow God, we follow the leading of God, um, our, our, our heart's intent should be in line with the Word of God. But sometimes, because we live in a sinful, sinful world, we, we can allow things to kind of creep in that we don't even recognize that it's creeping in. And then, and then we're going to need the Word of God to, to discern the intents of our heart. Because our heart can, can be distorted a little bit, whether we like it or not, if we don't continue to put God's Word first in our lives. So the Word of God will discern the intents of a heart. Because when you talk with people, you, you uh, work with people at work, work with people at school, uh, at work, at home. Um, when we're following God, when we're following the Word and allowing the Spirit of God to live on the inside of us and, and live in a bigger way, we can kind of discern we're talking to that person, we can kind of discern the intents of his heart just by what he, why his actions are, he or she's actions, the uh, way they talk. We can discern the intents of their heart. So then we have the opportunity to kind of correct them if they can, if they're asking to be corrected, or we can have the opportunity to stay, well, I'm going to keep that person at a distance because I can kind of in tell the intents of their heart. And I'm trying to keep my heart pure in line with God so I can be led by the Spirit of God, so I can uh, sense His leading. Okay? Uh, let's see, we're moving on. 4, 11, 2, 6, okay. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And that's part of our faith too, when we, we need to hold fast to our confession. If I'm saying a confession in my life, because I want to stay focused in the Word, I want to stay focused where God wants me to go, then I'm going to have to hold fast to a confession. Um, we speak words, and words are our life. And if I want to go in a certain direction, I'm going to have to speak words of life, speak words of truth, so I'm going to have to hold fast to that confession and not be silent. So many people, they're silent in their faith. They're silent in the direction they want to go in their faith. And that's not helping. You have to speak words of faith. You have to speak words of life. You have to speak a positive confession a lot of times. And the Word of God tells you that. But you have to speak a positive confession, so you have to hold fast to that confession if you want your faith to grow. Okay, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. All points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Je that was Jesus. Let us therefore come boldly, verse 16, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when we come boldly to the throne of grace, Jesus tells us to come boldly. He's, we're going to find mercy, and he's going to help us have that grace to help in time of need. Many times we'll have times of need, and we're going to need God's help, God's division, God's direction, God's understanding on our situation, and that grace will come and help. Sometimes you think about, uh, oh, you're doing something, and you need help doing something and you need help uh, working on something or whatever. And a thought just pops into your mind. A thought just pops into your, to your heart and says, yeah, that's right, that'll work. So that's, that's part of grace. That's part of God helping you. When you ask for him, he'll, he'll help you. And you'll know that it's, it's the right decision because you're 
you're connected with him. You're connected with the word of God. You can kind of sense that the word, it, it lines up with the word of God. That's how we continue to, to allow it to work in our lives. Okay, so verse, we're going to go bounce back a little bit in, in the chapter. Hebrews 4, 2 through, th- 2 through 3. Hebrews 4, 2 through 3. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Okay, so, and so he's saying, he's talking to these Hebrews. Uh, Paul's writing to the Hebrews. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Whole group of people, Jesus is, is preaching the gospel, and it was taught to them and to all of them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So when you're listening to a preacher, an evangelist, a missionary, or, or even maybe somebody on TV, and they're teaching on the word of God, you have to hear their word, and then you have to mix your faith with those who heard it. So you have to mix your faith, your belief, your understanding, your substance, your confidence, your conviction, your assurance of the word of God, your faith. You have to mix it with the words spoken, and that will help increase your faith. When it doesn't profit you, that means it wasn't mixed with faith. You want the word of God, when it's taught, you want it to be mixed with faith. It has to be mixed with your faith, and then it becomes a substance, and then it becomes a strength in your life when you, when you mix it with faith. Uh, verse 3, For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So when you do believe... When you mix your faith with the word spoken, then you can have rest. You can have rest. If if I pray for a healing uh, over my body and I know it lines up with the word of God, then I can have rest that it will come to pass. Just, just, uh, Just two weeks ago, I had I had a rash on both sides of the inside of my my arm. Just pop up out of nowhere. Didn't know where it came from. Just popped up out, out of nowhere just two weeks ago. So I, I, under, I, I, I took the word of God. I, I uh, took my confession and confessed a couple of scriptures that I knew. Laid my hands on them. And that was that. The rash was still there. But that was that. I entered into a state of rest because I knew what the Word of God says. I knew I was in line with the Word of God. I knew my faith was at that level to where I could believe for healing. And it's gone. It's gone now. I, have to, I had to use my faith. Once I, once I spoke to it, it was still there. Next day, it was still there. Next day, it was still there. Next day, it was still there. Oh, about, about five days in, three or four of them gone. Three or four more days, they're all gone. The other day, one was left on each arm, gone. So that's just an example of, of the substance that I took hold of used it in my faith, and then believe for it. And then when you're confident, see, I mean, you could have went to the doctor, could have went to put salve on it, could have put lotion on it or whatever. I didn't do either of that because I knew where I stood with the Word of God. I knew what I believed. I knew where my faith was. And so I just spoke over it like the Word God says, and then I had rest. I didn't worry about it anymore. I could see that it was still there, but then again, your faith isn't isn't developed on what you see. Your faith isn't developed on what you feel. Your faith is developed on what you know, what you have the assurance of, what you have the conviction of. 
and what you have the conf confidence on. Okay? All right, moving on. Okay, now we're going to go to Mark 9, 923. This is one of my favorite, favorite scriptures. And I'm telling you some examples like that just to stir your faith up. Just to stir up your faith in what God and his word can do in your life. I'm, I'm stirring, stirring you up. Wanting to bring you up to another level. And it's all going to be up to you. Okay, Mark 9, 23. Said to him, if you can believe... All things are possible to him who believes. Now, Jesus is saying that. So, if all things are possible to him who believes, and i got to hurry up real quick. Uh, all, if all things are possible to him who believes, then I have to get my believing in line with the Word of God because, because we live in a sinful world and sin all over our lives. Uh, I have to believe that if something happens to me down the road, I have to believe that all things are possible. I can't, I can't believe that they're not impossible because he says things are possible. So that includes healing, that includes finances, that includes health, uh, that includes uh, just everything because it's all, all means all. So I have to believe all things are possible to him who believes because that's what the scripture says okay so now I'm going to give you a quick quick examples real quick Romans 4 Romans 4 19 Romans 4, Romans 4. get the scriptures Romans 4 19 through 20 and, the, and these are some examples of of of, of faith, level, levels of faith, measured, measured, measured faith. Uh, Romans 4, 19 through 20. Okay. And not being weak in faith. See, you can have weak in faith. You can have weak. You can have weak faith. Romans 4, 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a uh, uh, 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. And he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Okay, so there, there Abraham did not, was not weak in faith. So that means you can be weak in faith, okay? So Abraham, Abraham wasn't weak in faith, but that means you can be weak in faith. Okay, Matthew 14 here we're going again, just showing you examples in the scriptures. Matthew 14, 28 through 31. Matthew 14, 28 through 31. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. This is when uh, he saw Jesus a walk uh, walking on the water, and he said, Command me to come to, to walk on the water with you. So he said, Come. Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? O you of little faith. So there it is. You can, have weak, you can have weak faith if you want. You can have little faith. Jesus, says, oh, Jesus told him, O you of little faith, even though he stepped out and took a few steps. All he needed to do was take a few more steps, and he would have reached Jesus, and Jesus would have said, O you of great faith. But here he says, O you of little faith. So he, he saw the boisterous uh, Waves going, getting big, and, and so uh, he faltered, which a lot of us would. But you see, there, there's an example of little faith. First Timothy one nineteen. Moving real quickly here. First Timothy one nineteen. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. 
So you can have shipwreck faith. And that's, and that's sadly, that's where, that's where, oh, I mean, we're getting better as, as believers, as Christians, as, as, as uh, believers in Christ. We're getting better. But I'd say probably still 60 to 70 percent of Christians all over the world are in these categories. Weak faith, little faith, or shipwreck faith. And when I say shipwreck faith, I mean, oh, they tried faith for a while. It didn't work. And they gave, and they gave up. That's what I mean by shipwreck faith. They, they lose confidence in what they believe because it didn't work. They said, they said some scriptures and they just didn't see it come to pass. So, that, so, then, they, so then they gave up. So that's, that's where shipwreck faith. And probably 60 to 70 percent of all Christians all throughout the world are right here in weak faith, little faith, and shipwreck faith. But you don't have to stay there. You can move on. Real quick, 2 Thessalonians, uh, right before, right before uh, Timothy. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as if it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. Now here, here um, Paul is talking to the Thessalonians, and, uh, or Tim, yeah, yeah, I think Paul, talking to the Thessalonians, and he's saying, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. So there, your faith can grow exceedingly. He just, he just tells them right there. Their faith is growing exceedingly by probably acting on the Word of God, believing the Word of God. Uh, we can develop our faith. Matthew 8.10. We'll go back to Matthew 8.10, what I, what I talked, talked about uh, back in May. And we'll go real quickly. Almost done. Hang in there. We're getting there. Uh, Matthew 8.10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Jesus, our teacher, the master, he's telling this centurion, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And, and, and why he said that was because Jesus, he, he's asking Jesus, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered and said in verse 8, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. Tells him, goes, those, he comes, goes, do this, do this. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them, Follow, surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. Why? Great faith is because he spoke it. The centurion didn't see it. The centurion was miles away from, from his family because he was asking him to heal his servant. He's miles away from him. He didn't see it. He just heard the words of what Jesus spoke, and that was enough, and that was enough faith. So faith can be measured. Weak faith, little faith, shipwrecked faith, Faith that grows exceedingly. And then we're going to have great faith. My desire is for, for me and for you, all of you who hear my voice, to a, a, aspire to have great faith. Great faith is going to change your life and those around you. Because great faith can do, do things that you can't even dream of and think of. And we all have the opportunity to have great faith. We all have the opportunity to have great faith. Every single one of us. We all have the opportunity. Hebrews 11.6, last scripture, last one. 11.6, and this is the payoff. I wrote payoff here. This is the payoff. This is the payoff where we want... Uh, why we want to have a strong faith, why we don't want to be weak in faith, why we don't want to be little in faith, why we don't want to have shipwrecked faith. This is the reason why we want to continue to, 
to grow or have our faith grow exceedingly, this is the payoff. Uh, Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when we follow God and we have an increasing level of faith or a great faith, we get answers. We see results. It come to pass. And that's what we want. That's what we want, where we want our faith. We want to see results. And, and we want to stand fast because sometimes you're not going to see results in a day, in a week, in two weeks, in a month, in a, in a year. But you're still going to have to stand firm. You're still going to have to have the confidence that what you believe in, spoke for in faith, you're still going to have to stand. And, there, and there's scriptures that are telling, you, telling us to stand. Because we, our faith is lining up with the word, word of God. We know we're not off. We know we're not wrong. It's lined up with the Word of God. We know what God's will is. God's will in our lives is the Word of God. So we, when we have that lined up, we can stand. If we have to stand a month, if we have to stand a week, if we have to stand a year, if we have to stand two years, we can still have the payoff. We can still have the payoff. We can still see the reward. We can still, still see it come to pass. He is a word of those who diligently seek him. And I, I like to, that, that word seek uh, means kind of uh, like, you're not, like you're not right there, that you're still seeking, still looking for something. I don't particularly like that word. I like uh, follow. Uh, I like the word follow better because he already lives on the inside of me. I'm following him. I'm following his leading. I'm following his word. I'm following his message. I'm following faith. So I, I like that word a little bit better than seek. Seek means that you're, you're not obtained it yet, but when you use faith, you believe that you receive it now. You have to believe you receive it now. Remember, you can't, not necessarily, you're not going to see it all the time. You're not going to feel it all the time. You're not going to maybe hear it all the time right away. That wouldn't take faith. If I, if I, saw, if I saw my healing right before my eyes, why do I need faith? It's already there. It's already happened. So faith is out there, I have to speak it, I have to receive it, faith, I have to receive it now, even though I don't see it, that's faith. We have to believe that Jesus died and rose again. That's faith. We didn't see it. None of us were there. None of, none of us uh, have seen it. We have to receive it by faith. Just like the Word of God, you have to receive it by faith. Father, we thank you, Father, for today. We thank you, Father, that your Word is true and that we have to receive it by faith. We know we don't have to have weak faith. We know we don't have to have little faith. We know we can have increasing faith because your word says so. We know that we can have great faith because if one, by, one guy in the Bible had great faith, we know that other people can have great faith. And it doesn't have to be in the Bible. It can be right now year 2023 we can know that people can have great faith and that is our desire as believers that should be our desire as we walk on and follow the leading of god in our in our lives we know we can have great faith we know we can uh, continue to follow the leading of god and we will step out and have great faith i thank you father that the opportunity is ours i thank you father that we'll always have grace to continue to move in faith and to, and, to, and to continue to grow in faith because of your grace in our lives, because of your love in our lives. We give you praise and glory, Lord. We thank you, Father, that Thanksgiving is a time that we can thank God. We can thank God for his provision. We can thank God for his love, that he died on the cross 
uh, for us, that we could have right relationship with him. We thank God that he has moved in our lives to get us to this place. We thank God that he is moving in our lives to get us to another place, to another place in, in our lives, in our walk with you. Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we, we want to exercise our thanksgiving, this thanksgiving, to be thanksgiving, to be thankful for God, thank you, thankful for his love in our lives, thankful for the message that he placed on our hearts. We give you praise and glory for it. We, we love you, Lord, with all our hearts. We give you praise and glory for it in the name of Jesus. Amen.